Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Today, we're going to be continuing our conversation about Starship manufacturers. Uh, mostly, we've talked about publicly traded companies that are pretty large scale, like Carillion Engineering or the Mighty Quad Drive Yards, and more recently, Horse Kessel Drive and Senior Fleet Systems. Today's manufacturer is a lot smaller scale in how many ships they produce, and more importantly, they're a state-sponsored and owned Starship manufacturing company, and they make some of the most beautiful Starships I've ever seen for some of the most important political figures of their time. And the story behind them is quite interesting and perhaps also a cautionary tale. Today we'll be talking about Theed Palace Engineering Corps. And now you can't invest your credits into them because they wouldn't want them anyway, because they most likely are an elaborate psyop for the Naboo monarchy. Unlike most of the other companies we've covered so far, Theed Hangers, as it was also known by locals, is not a company burdened by generating revenue, marketing new ships, or even designing them for a wider consumer base. This firm does not have to navigate the complex political realities of being a defense manufacturer. They don't have to worry about which side of a war they have to sell their ship to. And that is essentially because they have one client, a client that also gives them their budget, and that is the Theed Royal Palace that governs over all of Naboo. And having just one customer to please, Theed Palace engineers really only have to focus on a few set of things, creating high-performance luxury ships that were both aesthetically pleasing but also environmentally friendly. And the reason behind all of this is perhaps a bit darker than a 10-year-old version of myself realized when I first saw The Phantom Menace in theaters. Oh. Yippee! Most people's perception of Naboo comes from the extremely famous holodrama known as the Skywalker Saga. One of the main heroines in this story is Queen Padme Amidala, the youngest monarch in the planet's history. And it's through her eyes that we get to see Naboo for the first time. We get to tour Naboo's grand palaces, we get to see its grand avenues, and classic High Republic architecture. In one of the first entries in the Skywalker Saga, we're told a brief history of the Naboo's struggle against the Trade Federation, who brutally blockaded the planet and occupied Theed City's pristine streets with their droid armies. We learn about the noble, yet very simple-minded and savage Gungans, who joined forces with the humans in Naboo, and together, as a unified force, they managed to liberate their planet, under human leadership, of course. Padme even gives the Gungans a shiny ball to commemorate the sacrifice of hundreds of Gungan warriors who died heroically in what really was a diversionary attack 40 kilometers outside of the city to buy the humans more time to carry out their own operation. That's a story that most of us knew, especially people in my generation or, you know, kids, basically. We didn't really question much, but if you just look a little closer at the story, a lot of things just don't add up. What if I told you that Theed Palace Engineering Corps' main purpose was to support the extremely elegant and pristine image of the Naboo monarchy? What if I told you that this image was designed to misdirect people and hide the monarchy's more controversial past? Take a look at the Naboo Royal Starship, a J-Type 327 Nubian vessel. This is what most monarchs use for state visits. Its shape and design clearly harkens to the High Republic era of culture, and a philosophy of combining natural aesthetic beauty with technological excellence. The exterior of the ship was made out of, get this, uh, handcrafted and hand-polished royal chromium. I mean, there was a reason why Rolls-Royce used to be the pinnacle of automobile luxury, and that's because outside of the chassis, those cars were mostly hand-assembled, and many of the pieces were actually hand-crafted and hand-built, especially the wood finishes. In the Star Wars galaxy, where automation and assembly lines were able to produce anything from battle droids to massive Star Destroyers in bulk quantity, to have a hand-built Starship company is complete insanity. I mean, this is why TPEC, which is what we'll be calling this company for the rest of the video, is essentially the Rolls-Royce of the Star Wars galaxy. But in a much crazier way, because this is a Starship, and the engineering tolerances for failures in space are quite minimal, and to get human craftsmanship to match the perfection of an automated manufacturing system is going to cost you a lot of money and work hours. Now, chromium is not only a beautiful metal to look at, it's extremely expensive, and it's also a metal with a lot of unique properties. Stainless steel is an iron chromium alloy which increases resistance to rust, corrosion, Extra bonus points if you can guess what kind of helicopter that is. 
Stainless steel, which most of us have in our houses or in our cars, is an iron chromium alloy, which increases iron's resistance to rust corrosion and also gives it a higher heat tolerance. The chromium alloy plating used on TPEC's Royal Yachts give a natural heat resistance layer to the ship that is very effective against energy-based small arms fire and even larger ship-based weapons. It gives a lot more protection than just regular Durasteel found on most military ships. So why don't more ships use this coating? Well, it's extremely expensive and no one is paying for, you know, hand-assembled, hand-polished, hand-crafted uh, chromium plating for their starships. It's really the ultimate flex from a manufacturing, aesthetic, design, and defense point of view. And this is quite strange considering Naboo's pacifist and relatively isolated status in the galaxy. I mean, think about it. What other planets have a publicly funded custom starship manufacturing firm that builds these types of ridiculous ships? That's something you would expect from a dictator or a petrostate, but not from the elected monarch of a supposed democracy. And while Theed is an extremely beautiful city, the planet is hardly known as a rich or prosperous world. It's pretty underdeveloped. There's only a population of around 4.5 billion people here, and it's also in the mid-rim, which is not in the middle of anything. It's more on the peripherals. It's the next ring uh, to the outer rim. And out of that population of 4.5 billion, only 1.2 billion lived on the surface of the planet, on Naboo's calm and peaceful plains and mountain ranges, where there was plenty of fertile soil and easy to domesticate livestock like the gentle shock. Now, what the Naboo monarchy doesn't want people to know, or just didn't know themselves, was that the rest of the population, the Gungans, lived mostly in hidden cities beneath the oceans. Amongst the many terrifying and vicious monsters of the seas, like the Sando Aqua Monster or the OPC Killer, you know, we could dig a little deeper and ask why, you know, these air-breathing Gungans were forced to live in such a dangerous part of the world in these underwater cities. We could also ask why the Naboo didn't know about them, like the Harkonians didn't know about the Freemen on Arrakis. It's all kind of sketchy. But no, that would involve chartering a flight out to the Midrim territories where no one really wants to go. And so instead, journalists wrote fluff pieces about the Naboo monarchy when they came to visit horse hunt, where they can completely control their image and what they showed to the public. And the Holonet journalists in the core bought into everything that the Naboo presented to them, whether it was Queen Amidala's ridiculous headpieces or her fantastic dresses. But what impressed everyone more than anything was TPEC's many unique yachts. And as these ships glided to the surface, people were always reminded that these ships featured some of the cleanest plasma-burning engines in the galaxy that does not spew toxins and clouds of black dust in the air so you can better see your own reflection on its fantastically polished chromium-plated holes. Because that's the whole idea behind royalty, isn't it? They wow us with their riches, immense wealth, so that maybe we'll bend knee and obey their orders. That's the whole idea behind luxury. Luxury is designed to give people inspiration and dreams. Maybe if you work hard enough, one day you can buy this Louis Vuitton back. But look closely at who buys Louis Vuitton. It's not really rich people. Oftentimes it's middle class people. Other people spend like a month's salary uh, purchasing things that they really shouldn't be doing. If you look at truly rich people, they don't buy stuff like that at all. And when you step aboard the Nabu Royal Starship, the illusion doesn't end there. As a matter of fact, the interior is even more luxurious. And if you are lucky enough to be granted an audience with the Queen, you don't get to sit next to her in a common room, like on most Republic diplomatic vessels around a circular table with a couch. Instead, you enter a freaking throne room where the Queen holds an audience for you. I mean, it's one thing for a Queen in her palace to go from her living quarters to a throne room where she has a scheduled window of time where she meets with other people. That makes sense, okay? You want a designated place in your massive palace for meetings, okay? But if you're on a 76 meter long ship, which is quite small if you have your royal attachment attendant and crew members on board, why not keep it more casual? I mean, meet in the common room. Why such pomp and circumstance? What's even weirder is the queen actually has to sit in this throne room during the entire flight, most likely so she doesn't bump into other people. It's just all really strange. I mean, why do this? Why have a monarch in the first place? It's designed to create an aura, to trick the masses into believing that this person is somehow better above, you know, the corruption and, and desires of the average man or woman. It's kind of like how Mr. Beast surrounds himself with the aura of being this philanthropist who loves giving away money to people. So what are the Nabu hiding with all that crumb and elegance? The establishment of TPEC is weird for a variety of different reasons that we mentioned before, but its creation also coincided with a huge economic and political shift on this planet, which is important. 
For most of its history, Naboo was mainly an agricultural planet with some artisanal craft cottage industries here and there. The planet wasn't necessarily isolationist, but the people's culture and its focus on art, beauty, and harmony, along with the lack of resources and any advanced industry or economic development, meant that most of the galaxy just left Naboo alone. It wasn't interesting. There weren't opportunities here. This is also why TPEC, when it was founded, attracted some of the brightest and most ambitious individuals on Naboo. It was also an honor to serve the monarch. But the reason why Naboo could fund such a high-end starship manufacturing company was because Naboo actually became a petrostate after the discovery of massive plasma deposits beneath the surface of the planet, you know, where the Gungans lived. But here's the thing, the Naboo lacked the funding they needed to carry out the type of operation that they wanted to create. And so they ended up contracting the Trade Federation to start building a mining operation and also a large interstellar spaceport for the export of plasma. Now, if the Naboo just wanted to mine enough plasma resources for their own domestic consumption to remain, uh, you know, energy independent, they could have just done it themselves. I mean, the Gungans clearly had their own processes to extract the energy resource and used it for the majority of their technology. But then Naboo wanted to export this extremely uh, high quality energy, which could be used for specialized types of ships or industrial purposes. This plasma could definitely fetch a very high price on the market. But plasma mining is a risky venture, especially if you don't have the right infrastructure and skills to exploit said resources. The Star Wars energy market is extremely, extremely competitive. And for Naboo to even stand a chance of exporting any of their product, which they would have to store until they actually can export, they would have to scale their operation up to such a size where they could still make enough money by lowering the price of this energy. And this would all be impossible without capital investment. So the other way they could do this would be to slowly build up their operation, uh, but they would probably have to take on a lot of debt in order to even fund these first kind of business ventures. And ultimately, this would lead to kind of a cycle of debt and a lack of production, and they most likely would never get their export business off the ground. The Trade Federation, with its expertise and connections and huge fleets of vessels and engineers, more or less guaranteed that a plasma mining operation could be profitable within a few years. Now, there were competing political factions on Naboo, including an isolationist, xenophobic bloc, which uh, Queen Amidala's predecessor, San Andrasa, actually supported. But they were quickly defeated by the pro-development bloc, which a young Palpatine actually supported. Let's not forget that he played a role in this as well. Now, both of these political blocks had good and bad people. You had people on the isolationist side who were more worried about the natural beauty of the planet, who didn't want um, what was truly a sketchy company being involved in resource extraction on the planet. You also had xenophobic people who just were against outsiders coming to Naboo, even though this planet clearly needed more development and more capital for it to become a more successful planet. You also had people on the development block that were kind of evil as well, like Palpatine. Palpatine actually joined the pro-development block to, uh, to, to rebel against his father, who was more of an isolationist. But yeah, there were also individuals like Padme Amidala who wanted to create more political connections with other planets in the trauma sector. Uh, to create more political unity and trade, which is obviously a good thing. What is clear, though, is the windfall from plasma extraction is ultimately why Naboo could afford a state-of-the-art shipbuilding firm like TPEC. Now, this plasma, as we mentioned, was exceptionally pure and produced very low emissions, but this was completely greenwashing the fact that uh, such operations were made without consent from the Gungans. But the Naboo completely glossed over the fact that they were the ones responsible for bringing the Trade Federation over to the planet when they convinced the Gungans and sent thousands of their warriors with primitive weapons to fight a moderate army of battle droids out in the open. I mean, it's clear that the Gungans would have fared far better attacking the Separatist droid army in guerrilla-style attacks in the swamplands, in the forest, or even underwater. But Queen Amidala focused more on the well-being of her own people, urged the Gungans to quickly present themselves out in the open in the midst of the Great Plains where their troops stood little chance of winning in an almost Napoleonic style of battle. It's clear that the Trade Federation was only here because of Naboo's greed. It's clear that hundreds of Gungan warriors died because of Naboo's greed. And what's worse, the Gungans didn't even profit out of this at all, outside of that shiny ball that Amidala grants their leader. I mean, honestly, if you think about it, the Gungans would have fared a lot better if they just let the Trade Federation wipe out the Naboo. 
and they could have just emerged later on and took over their planet by themselves. And just how rich did Plasma make Naboo? I mean, take a look at TPEC's most famous product, the N1 Starfighter. And these were just mass produced off the shelf kind of components. Uh, Nubian and Star Drive only built custom parts for very wealthy clients, which Naboo clearly was. And what TPEC got was the J-Type engine, which could be upscaled or downscaled and used in various projects. And these engines tended to burn fuel at an extremely high temperature, which meant less particulates made it out of the exhaust. That, along with Naboo's pure plasma, made the J-Type one of the cleanest burning engines in the galaxy. The N1 Starfighter, despite being designed during the uh, pre-Clone Wars era, was extremely advanced for its time. Its engines gave it incredibly fast sublight speeds, and it was equipped with a Class 1 hyperdrive, which was simply unheard of at the time. And also kind of unnecessary for a planetary defense force. Although, these N1s did usually escort other TPEC yachts on longer missions. The ship also had an astromech slot for a droid along with twin blaster cannons and prototype torpedoes. And generally, starfighters were extremely robust, especially when you consider what Naboo's defense needs were. Now, perhaps on another day, we can get a bit deeper into Naboo's history and political system. As an investor in the Galactic Stock Exchange, if you want to survive, if you want to make it long term and not zero out, if you want to build capital, there's only really one way of investing. It's not through speculation. I mean, I think like 90% of day traders eventually zero out. Um, a lot of people focus on making the big bucks when really you want to just stay in the market as long as you can without having any big losses if you can limit your losses you ultimately will win and the best way to do that is really doing research it's not just trying to price companies or see where the trends are it's about understanding the companies themselves and while tbec will never be publicly traded this is a great thought exercise at looking at how companies operate and there are going to be a lot of companies out there in the world that are going to look sketchy. The the products, the finances just don't add up. Uh, you'll see that they have a weird customer base or that they just are in a market that they shouldn't belong to. And usually those are big signs that this company is either scamming people or trying to cover up someone like the Naboo monarchy in this case. And this is not going to be a safe place to put your hard-earned money. And so no matter how many crazy people on the financial holonets tell you to buy, 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 only trust your own research or individuals, analysts that you have already vetted and uh, understand what exactly their process is. If a company doesn't have true value, it doesn't matter how glossy their ships are or how high their stock price is, because usually in 95% of those situations, what's being sold is just hot air. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, I am not a fiduciary. I am simply a spice runner. I'll see you guys next time.